morning, everyone. We welcome all of you to this uh, Sunday morning worship here at UCCP Cosmopolitan Church. On behalf of the ministerial team who are all here, uh, Reverend uh, Veronica T. Stayo, Reverend Fritz Jordan Mata, even if he's still recovering from an operation, DM Jeff Ramirez and myself. And of course, uh, our choir conductor, uh, Ga Tabada, we welcome all of you once again. We have a very special day today. This is the day when for the first time, our pulpit will be graced by the presence of an Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church. He is not only going to be here as a guest, he will be our guest preacher. Uh, the, uh, the, the Archbishop of Cagayan de Oro, um, Reverend the, uh, His Excellency uh, um, Antonio Ledesma. Now I don't anymore know whether we call them Excellency or Your Grace, but anyway, he's a friend of ours, our uh, Bishop, our Archbishop Antonio Ledesma. I will introduce him at, le at length later on. I also would like to make a very important announcement uh, that uh, today uh, not only will he be speaking here, uh, the Archbishop will also be speaking at the Visayan service. But of course this is all going to be virtual. Uh, I look forward to the day when the Archbishop can come here, here in person, but uh, it's all going to be virtual today. He is in Cagayan de Oro and will be preaching from there. Uh, through a video message sent to us earlier. Okay. And then I have, again, uh, very important announcements for tomorrow. Tomorrow, our uh, Archbishop, Tony Lidesma, will be delivering a lecture on 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines. And together with the Archbishop is the Reverend Father Dionito Cabillas of the Iglesia Filipina Independiente, our neighboring church here. Um, they are all going to talk about 500 years of Christianity from 8 in the morning to 12 noon. So that will be lecture, open forum, and uh, some inter intermiss intermission, mga songs. But anyway, that will be for four hours tomorrow. This will be a very interesting uh, lesson. This is usually one semester in some uh, seminaries. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a very broad, sweeping historical account of 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines. That's tomorrow, 8 to 12, via Zoom, via Zoom. And um, it ma I do not know if the, the link has been sent. Anyway, if the link has not been sent, uh, send us a text message if you would like to listen so we can send you the link. Next announcement. On Wednesday, the usual Wednesday forum, which is uh, co-sponsored by the UCCP Cosmopolitan Church, will be held in the afternoon of the 17th, Wednesday, uh, from 1.30 to 4.30 in the afternoon. Regular po yan. Every month on the third Wednesday, we have the Wednesday forum co-sponsored by UCCP Cosmopolitan Church. In fact, the Wednesday Forum began here, right here in this church, in 1973. 1973. It was started by then Senate President, uh, the later Senate President, Jovito Salonga, and Reverend Dr. Cirilo Rigos, pastor of this church. That was in 1973. So we, we should be celebrating or we are celebrating our 48th year already at this time. Anyway, next Saturday, another very important event is the second lecture of the Reverend of, of Dr. T. Valentino Sitoy Jr., a professor, a retired professor of Silliman University and many other, and one other university in, the, in Negros. He will speak on Reformation, um, and uh, more specifically on the ecumenical movement 
and Vatican II. Vatican II. That will be on Saturday, 8 to 12 in the morning. Okay. So these are very important announcements uh, for this uh, week. This week alone. Now, uh, of course, in December, we will have another lecture by Father Richard uh, uh, Babau on the Counter-Reformation, but that's another event. I'll, I'll make the necessary announcement for that later on. But um, let me also make uh, another um, uh, special plug uh, for um, the SINAG Virtual Christmas Concert. SINAG is, uh, pro production is going on pretty well. Uh, we will have some meetings this week to check on things. The SINAG concert will be held on December 18, 6 o'clock in the evening. It's a free concert, but in order for it to be, to be free, we would like as many people to contribute to uh, a fund. And we will also put the announcements on the fund, on the bank account where you can put your contributions. Or you can also um, text us and we can email you a letter we can email you a letter of, uh, uh, to invite you to participate. You can email me or you can check our uh, uh, Cosmo page. Our email address is there. Okay. So that's very, these are very important activities of the church uh, this, uh, this year. Now, just to let you know, yesterday we had a very important activity as well of the Board of Evangelism and Missions. They had a food feeding program. They were able to distribute food to 120 or more people in the streets here surrounding Cosmo. And siyempre, hindi, kula, hindi enough yung kanilang dala, but at least we were able to feed a very good uh, nutritious meal of uh, a meat as well as egg and rice and water to 120 people yesterday. Uh, it's, symbolic of the love that we have for uh, people. It is not going to change the structures of our society, but it will change the structure of their stomach uh, for yesterday anyway. So um, these are announcements and uh, we will now uh, prepare ourselves to worship God. Um, again, if there are um, uh, messages that you would like to give us, just let us know through the Cosmo uh, page. Let us now worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Come, let us give thanks to God. We gather together to praise the one who strengthens the weak and hears the prayers of the forgotten. Come, let us give thanks to Christ. We gather together to sing of the one who calls us to serve those who are hungry and alone at this time of the year. Come, let us give thanks to the Spirit. We gather together to exalt the one who provokes us to love not only our family and friends, but also the guests among us. Let us all rise for our hymn of adoration. <laughs>
Let us pray, eternally righteous God, merciful judge of all the living. In your love, you called us to share the glory of Christ. Strengthen our hearts in every good work and word, that we may be steadfast in your ways and always believe your truth. Come and heal our lives this day. Open our hearts to receive your words of hope and joy that we may become faithful servants of yours in this world which you have loaned to us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. As God's people with the knowledge of this truth, let us approach the throne of grace with the confidence and assurance that God welcomes us. God hears us and is ready to redeem us. As those who recognize our sinfulness, let us confess together. Most, Most holy, holy God, God we, confess we confess to you and, and to each other that we are rarely just in all our ways and far from being kind in all our deeds. What we want to be and what we actually are are two different things. We need both your justice and your kindness to convict us of our sins, to forgive and cleanse us, and to save us from the power of evil in the days that lie ahead. Grant to us, loving God, the grace of a new beginning and the joy of an enlarged love for you. Give us the passion for all your loving ways. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Redeemer. Amen. steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and His mercy is over all His works. In the name of the living God, through the grace of Jesus Christ the Son, and with the authority of the Spirit, I declare to you the forgiveness of sins and the life that is eternal. We will extol you, our God and Savior, and glorify your name forever and ever. Every day we will praise you and glorify your name forever and ever. Standing be upon all of you and us. Let us pass this peace to one another and to everyone with us in our homes and wherever we might be. Peace be unto all of us. Amen. Let us all rise for the reading of our scripture this morning is taken from the gospel according to john 
chapter 17, verse 21. That all may be one. People of God, the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Greetings and a pleasant day to all of you, my friends. 
This year, we are celebrating the 500th anniversary of the coming of Christianity to the Philippines. They'll be joined on December 18 by the Manila Concert Choir, uh, headed by our Secretary of Education, uh, Leonor Magtolis uh, Briones, who is the honorary chair of the Sinag Steering Committee. This is a concert, a free concert, December 18 at 6 o'clock in the evening. And as I said, if you'd like to contribute, let us know so we can send you a letter. And uh, so now, as I also forgot in the beginning to mention that the reason why my in-laws are here is because we are kind of marking the fourth anniversary, death anniversary of our of my mother-in-law, uh, Rosita Perea Nable, fourth anniversary. Uh, on November 5, she worshipped here in Cosmopolitan Church, 2017. Worshipped here and Harry Rocky was here with a picture with Harry together and uh, uh, seven days later, she passed on to eternal life after having a bout with high blood pressure, after taking a lot of uh, crabs. So be, be careful with crabs. You might be bitten by it. Um, so these are the flowers uh, to memorialize and to mark uh, the anniversary of my mother-in-law. Linda, once again, that's Linda over there. Linda? She's wearing the dress that should have been worn by Mama uh, in her coffin, but uh, anyway, there she is wearing it now. My in-laws are also here. Okay, may I uh, use this point to uh, introduce our speaker further. Our speaker is here. Uh, uh, you can see he's uh, fully garbed uh, with his uh, Archbishop attire, and there's a short, uh, short description of him in in this um, Cosmo News. But I'd like to read for us the full uh, bio data. Like I said, this is very, very important event in our church. First time that an archbishop, it's not the first time that a priest would speak in our pulpits because I know that in some of my events in the past, we've had priests speaking in our pulpit. But not just a bishop, but an archbishop of the church who just retired. Uh, is going to speak to us this morning. Uh, Archbishop Antonio J. Ledesma, uh, Society of Jesus, SJ and DD, or Doctor of Divinity, was born on March 28, 1943, in Iloilo City. He was ordained a priest on April 16, 1973, at Haro Cathedral, Iloilo City. On June 13, 1996, Pope John Paul II appointed him coadjutor bishop of Ipil, Sambuanga del Zur. He was ordained bishop on August 31, 1996. His installation took place on July 16, 1997. On June 28, 1997, he succeeded as bishop of Ipil. Pope Benedict XVI appointed him on March 3, 2006, Archbishop of Cagayan de Oro City. He is currently chairman of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines Episcopal Commission on Interreligious Dialogue and member of the Episcopal Commission on Social Action, Justice, and Peace. He is one of the chairpersons of the Philippine Ecumenical Peace Platform. This is where Linda and I are with him and that's how we became very close friends because we have been working together since 2007. So it's been uh, uh, many years, 17 uh, years that we've, been, uh, we've known each other. He was going to uh, visit us at home in Cotabato. Unfortunately, the meeting was postponed. I would have loved to have him in our house and to say a mass in, with our Catholic friends in that barrio in Payong Payong. And we were already prepared for that, but the meeting was postponed. Anyway, Archbishop Ledesma uh, speaks English, Tagalog, Hiligaynon, Cebuano, Spanish, and Latin. He spent his elementary years at St. Aloysius School 
and later at the Ateneo de Manila. Since then, he remained with the Ateneo until he finished his degree in history and government, graduating magna cum laude in 1963. He studied philosophy and theology at the Loyola House of Studies from 1966 to 1968 and from 1970 to 1973, respectively. He attained his master's degree in political science from the University of the Philippines. He attended the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the United States, completing his doctorate in development in 1980. On May 30, 1963, Archbishop Ledesma entered the Society of Jesus. He was ordained priest on April 16, 1973. He served as an assistant parish priest in CI, Sambuanga, Sibugay from 1980 to 81, from 82 to 86. Then he worked as a professor and was assigned to various positions in Xavier University. He taught sociology, economics, and religious studies. Daming uh, subject na alam si Bishop. John Pope John the, Paul II appointed Ledesma as co-adjutor prelate of Epil on June 30, 1996, and then succeeded, as I already said earlier, succeeded uh, Bishop Iskaler as prelate of Epil on June 28, 1997. On March 4, 2006, he was appointed by Pope Benedict XVI as Archbishop of Cagayan de Oro, and he retired on June 23, 2020. Uh, last year lang po, uh, the Archbishop retired as Archbishop of Cagayan de Oro City. And now he's busy speaking around and uh, talking about peace and the need for comprehensive peace in the country. And I really am so glad that we can have him today as speaker. And tomorrow, once again, I just want to remind you, he will be speaking in a 8 to 12 seminar or webinar tomorrow morning by Zoom. We will give you the link uh, later uh, today, uh, DM Jeff. Uh, let's, let's give that to them. So, dear friends, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to present to us the retired Archbishop of Cagayan de Oro City, uh, Archbishop Antonio Halandoni Ledesma, SJ. Archbishop Ledesma, sir, thank you. Greetings and a pleasant day to all of you, my friends. This year, we are celebrating the 500th anniversary of the coming of Christianity to the Philippines. But let us not forget that also four years ago, we were celebrating or commemorating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, which at that time was a dividing moment of the church but at this time, also a call for reconciliation towards Christian unity. So it is in that sense that we can first reflect that uh, the Reformation was initiated by Martin Luther, who was born in 1483 during an age of discovery of the new world. It was a transitional period between two eras, medieval and Renaissance. The Church of Luther's time also reflected the transitory, oftentimes turbulent period of decadence and renewal. And for us in the Philippines, this 500th anniversary of the first signs of Christianity on the islands will be celebrated with the first mass of baptisms and the legacy of the Santo Nino icon in Cebu. How then should Christians look on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation? For some, the Reformation brings back painful memories of the division of the church. For others, Reformation means renewal. But perhaps for all of us today, the Reformation poses the challenges of ecumenism and reconciliation, recalling Jesus Christ's own prayer for one flock and one shepherd. When Pope Francis visited Sweden on October 31, 2016, 
upon invitation of the Lutheran World Federation to start off the commemoration of this 500th anniversary of the Reformation, he was asked what he learned from the Reformation. His reply was twofold, greater centrality to the sacred scripture in the church's life and continuous reform of the church, Ecclesia Sub Semper Reformanda. Indeed, Luther himself was calling for reforms, not division of the church of his time that had been racked by corruption, abuse of the selling of indulgences and political intrigues with bishops lording over benefices and local princes vying with the powers of the papacy. During the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines, the crown supported the parish priests under the Patronato Real and also appointed the bishops. Luther belonged to the reformed order of the Augustinian hermits in Erfurt. He was influenced by Bernard of Clairvaux and Erasmus of Rotterdam in posting his 95 thesis on the door of the church in Wittenberg on October 31, 1517, the young Luther was ardently calling for reforms and the opportunity to dialogue with church authorities. Personally, Luther, the ardent monk and professor of theology, was preoccupied with his search for a gracious God and the question of salvation or justification, much in the same spirit that the rich young man asked of our Lord, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Despite his protestations, Luther's views vis-a-vis -vis his adversaries were engulfed in an atmosphere of polemics and controversies. At a time when the Bible was inaccessible to the ordinary Christian and the lives of not a few priests and bishops were all but exemplary. The early attempts by church authorities to give a hearing to Luther and his growing number of adherents failed. The Protestants' position was articulated in the Augsburg Confession of 1530, which was not resolved by the subsequent confutation of the church in Rome. Religious conflicts broke out, abetted by the Northern German princes, desirous of neutralizing the influence of the papacy in earthly and political matters. The Peace of Augsburg in 1555 brought about a practicable compromise in recognizing the religious affiliation of the local Lord as the deciding factor for his vassals. Cuius regio, eius religio. On the side of the Catholic Church, there was no clear ecclesiology at the time and only a kind of doctrine on the hierarchy. It would only be at the Council of Trent in 1545 to 63 that Catholic Church positions were defined, oftentimes in adversarial stories capped with a condemn condemnatory anathema sit. The outbreak of the bloody Thirty Years' War in 1618-48, barely a year after the first centenary of the Reformation, gives us an indication of how wide the gap had become between Catholics and Protestants. This was perhaps no different from the current religious wars among Muslim Sunnis and Shiites in the Middle East. Towards dialogue and reconciliation, if the first 100 years of the Reformation was characterized by polemics and controversies, we can say that this 500th anniversary is taking place in an age of ecumenism and the expressed desire from all sides for Christian unity. This is particularly so during the observance of Christian Unity Week, starting on January 25, Feast of the Conversion of St. Paul. In the Philippines, we also observe at the same time National Bible Week, attesting to our acceptance of a common Bible translation. This is the result of more than a century of biblical scholarships by Protestant and Catholic theologians, critically examining the word of God through the words of men in the various books of the Bible. <clears throat> As a common heritage of all Christian communities, 
the Bible provides the groundwork for ongoing ecumenical efforts. Noteworthy among these projects has been the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification signed at the highest level by both the Lutheran World Federation and the Roman Catholic Church on October 31, 1999. This document was also affirmed by the World Methodist Council in 2006. The ecumenical project was initiated by Lutheran and Catholic theologians in 1980 on the occasion of the 450th anniversary of the Augsburg Confession. In the same year, a working group of Protestant and Catholic theologians published their study, The Condemnations of the Reformation, Do They Still Divide? One of the most recent documents that come out from the collaborate, collaborative effort is the report of the Lutheran Roman Catholic Commission on Unity issued in 2013 with the significant title, From Conflict to Communion on Lutheran Catholic Common Commemoration of the Reformation in 2017. The report focuses on four topics in Luther's theology, justification, Eucharist, ministry, particularly of priests and bishops, and scripture and tradition. The discussion follows three steps for each of these topics. Luther's perspective, followed by Catholic concerns on the topic, and a summary of how Luther's theology, vis-a-vis -vis Catholic doctrines, can be brought into ecumenical dialogue. The summary highlights the common points of affirmation and the remaining differences. In the case of the first topic on justification, the summary reiterates the full agreement of the 1999 Joint Declaration. The understanding of the doctrines of justification set forth in this declaration shows that the consensus in basic truths of the doctrine of justification exists between Lutherans and Catholics. The declaration also negates the mutual condemnations from the Council of Trent and the Lutheran confessions that had been pronounced earlier. The report notes this is a highly remarkable response to the conflicts over this doctrine that lasted for nearly half a millennium. Here is a summary of the ecumenical reconciliation of the understanding of good works of the justified. On one side, the Catholic view, and on the other side, the Lutheran perspective. A more recent report has been published in 2015 entitled Declaration on the Way, Church, Ministry, and the Eucharist. This was issued jointly by the Bishop's Committee for Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. The study expounds on 32 statements of agreement on church ministry and Eucharist. These are offered as instances of the imperfect but real and growing unity of Catholics and Lutherans. The study includes a recommendation for religious educators, as well as Lutheran and Catholic seminaries to provide third opportunities for their students to learn about the progress in Catholic Lutheran relations. This then is the title page of that document, Declaration on the Way, Church, Ministry, and Eucharist, which by the way, is also available on the internet. What then are the ecumenical imperatives? Cardinal Avery Dulles of the Society of Jesus, a Catholic theologian, has once described three dimensions in a Christian's faith response to revelation, faith, as intellectual assent to doctrine or orthodoxy. Secondly, faith as fiducial trust in God, like a child holding the hand of his parent. And third, faith as correct practice or good works or orthopraxis, 
From his monastic and mystical background, Luther tended towards fiducial trust in a gracious God, the God of mercy. Catholics, on the other hand, since the Council of Trent, may focus more on faith as assent to doctrine and pronouncements of the magisterium. On the other hand, other Christians may focus on works of charity and social service. Notwithstanding the various emphases, all three dimensions of faith are requisite in every believer's life and response to Jesus Christ's revelation of the Father's love and sending of the Holy Spirit. Five ecumenical imperatives mentioned in the report can help us take, take the steps forward in our intra-faith ecumenical dialogue. The first one is this, Catholics and Lutherans, we should also read Protestants, should always begin from the perspective of unity, not division, in order to strengthen what is held in common, even though the differences are more easily seen and experienced. What has happened in the past cannot be undone, but how we perceive the past can be changed by in-depth historical research, appreciative theological inquiry, and a healing of memories. Indeed, succeeding generations of Christians do not experience the same emotional hurts and pains that divided the reformers from the institutional church during the time of the Reformation. In encouraging ecumenical dialogue among theologians, the Council favors fathers of the Catholic Church's Second Vatican Council observed that when comparing doctrines with one another, they should remember that in Catholic doctrine, there exists an order of hierarchy of truths since they vary in their relations to the foundations of the Christian faith. This is from the decree on ecumenism. Leaning towards an inclusivist institutionalism, the council fathers also point out that many elements that give life to the church itself can exist even outside the visible boundaries of the Catholic church, such as the written word of God, the life of grace, faith, hope, and charity with the other interior gifts of the Holy Spirit, as well as visible elements. The Council Fathers conclude, all of these which come from Christ and lead back to him belong by right to the one church of Christ. A second guideline, Protestants and Catholics must let themselves continuously be transformed by the encounter with the other and by the mutual witness of faith. Pope Francis himself has repeatedly urged Catholics to engage in a culture of encounter with the other. The decree on ecumenism states, Catholics must gladly acknowledge and esteem the truly Christian endowments from our common heritage, which are to be found among our separated brethren. It is right and salutary to recognize the riches of Christ and virtuous works in the lives of others who are bearing witness to Christ, sometimes even to the shedding of their blood. Citing the ongoing persecution of various communities of Christians in the Middle East, Pope Francis has remarked that we are now indeed experiencing an ecumenism of blood. More recently, a nearer home we can say that Catholic and Protestant Christians have also undergone a similar ecumenism of blood in the crisis in Marawi, with the destruction of Dansalan College, run by the United Church of Christ in the Philippines, and the desecration of the Catholic Church, together with the killings and protracted detention of Christian hostages. A third the guideline, Catholics and Protestants should commit themselves to seek visible unity, to elaborate together what this means in concrete steps and to strive repeatedly toward this goal. In a multicultural and globalized world that is increasingly becoming secularized, Christian unity becomes a missionary mandate and our response to the Lord's Prayer at the Last Supper that all may be one, 
as you, Father, are in me and I in you. I pray that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. The Catholic Church recognizes the Trinitarian formula for baptism in Protestant churches as valid and non-repeatable and as a sign of unity, even if not in perfect form. Intercommunion of the Eucharist has been a long-standing aspiration for Lutherans and Catholics. Several parishes have organized joint prayer services for Catholics and Protestants to highlight the call for Christian unity. Can we not also have joint processions and way of the cross, especially during Holy Week when Christians of all denominations are invited to reflect deeply on Christ's reconciling passion and death for all of us. A fourth guideline, Protestants and Catholics should jointly rediscover the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ for our time. Mercy and compassion was the theme for the papal visit in the Philippines in January 2015. Jesus is the face of the Father's mercy. Going beyond confessional oppositions, all the faithful who call themselves Christian should strive to live Christ and share Christ to the world. In contrast to the earlier period of religious intolerance, another Vatican II document, the Declaration on Religious Freedom, has stressed the sacredness of religious freedom as a human right based on the dignity of the human person. This right means that all men should be immune from coercion so that within due limits, nobody is forced to act against his convictions, nor is anyone to be restrained from acting in accordance with his convictions in religious matters. Jesus Christ himself is the prime exemplar for respecting the freedom of everyone he encountered during his public ministry. Looking back in history, Catholics and Protestants can ask for mutual forgiveness for the violence and bearing false witness against each other. Ironically, Christians of differing persuasions while invoking the same God and sacred scriptures have been instrumental in making martyrs of each other. A fifth guideline, Catholics and Protestants should witness together to the mercy of God in proclamation and service to the world. In the Bishops' Ulama Dialogues in Mindanao, Catholic and Protestant bishops and religious leaders on one side have engaged in peace-building dialogue with Muslim religious leaders on the other side. I have also worked with Protestant religious leaders in the Philippine Ecumenical Peace Platform, which tries to broker the peace between the government and the National Democratic Front of the Philippines. Over the past years, there have been interfaith uh, workshops on climate change involving religious leaders from Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, and indigenous people communities. This is where faith as orthopraxis can be recognized by other believers and non-believers. Lutheran Archbishop Nathan Soder Soderblom has remarked, doctrine divides, but service unites. The road towards full Christian unity still lies ahead, even as many milestones have already been reached. Commenting on the challenges for the church in Asia, Archbishop Felix Machado, Chair of the Office of Ecumenical and Interreligious Dialogue of the Federation of Asian Bishops Conferences, has commented, the unity of the church is not imagined by Pope Francis as concentric circles around a Roman center, but a multifaceted reality, not a puzzle to be solved from outside, but a whole which reflects the light of Christ. The Pope has also used Oscar Kuhlman's phrase in calling for a reconciled diversity. Asked why he went to Sweden to mark the start of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, Pope Francis replied, 
that his was a very eclipsal journey in the ecumenical field. May our session at this time also be part of that journey of faith. I thank you, my friends, and God bless to everyone. In your holy wisdom, you granted us the gift of minds that are always seeking to know you more. By that blessing comes our responsibility to continually turn to you in prayer for all the ways in which we can expand and enlighten our hearts and minds. Hear us as we pray. Teach us, Teach us guide us, us, make us make one. one. For the great gift of all the minds and bodies that have instilled in us the value of education and for all the ways we have misused our education for status over service, bless our seminaries across the country and make them always wellspring of humble and generous servants. Teach us, forgive us, make us, make one. us one. For the tireless work of leaders in the church, and for the seminaries and services of theological education that continue to provide outlets for all people seeking to answer your call through faithful inquiry, dedicated learning, and lingering hard questions. Teach them, bless, bless them, them along, along the, the way, way. Make, make us, us one. one. For the ways we can contribute to the ever-growing need in our world to learn of your love and benefit from your compassion. Make us ever mindful of your generosity that spurs growth in your church through prayer, money, time, instruction, and worship. Keep in our hearts all those who contribute to the beauty of your church through every seen and unseen aspect of theological education. Make us ever grateful to the people, seen and unseen, who have made our church leaders who they are. Teach, Teach us, us all, all keep, keep us, us all in your spirit, spirit of generosity, that, that we, we may be one. Amen. Amen. Before the video presentation, let me just say that this message of the Archbishop has already been sent to many of you. If you'd like to receive a copy, please email us and we can send it to you post haste. It is a very uh, important message and we've learned a lot from it. This uh, ecclesial journey together, reconciled diversity, all these wonderful concepts that the Archbishop outlined in his sermon are going to be very useful for us. And also in the local level, we have a group here called the uh, Manila Church People Ecumenical Fellowship. It is jointly presided over by Father John Laydon and yours truly. And we have been doing uh, ecumenical activities in the local uh, church level. So uh, this journey together in reconciled diversity is what we are trying to do so that we can mutually learn uh, from each other. Let us now watch this video of 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines. Thank you. We stand before the grand horizon. Five hundred years of faith, grateful today. We bear the gift of mission. Totally yours, we give ourselves faithfully yours until the end. To, to your, your mission, Lord, we give our yes.
We are living, breathing messages of God's love for the world. This is our work of faith, our labor of love, and our steadfastness of hope in Jesus Christ. Like the earliest Christians, we are here in this place because of the commitment, faith, and generosity of others who share the good news of the gospel in their time. So we turn now in our time and share our faith and our commitment through generous giving to support the ministry of this church in Christ's name. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise. pray together. We, we who are full can, can now give bread, bread to others. We who are well off can reach out to raise up, up the poor. The poor. We, we who have everything can offer a seat of honor to those who have nothing. nothing. We who are blessed by you, exalted God, God can be blessings to others. others. And, and so we pray, pray that the gifts we have may give hope, hope to the despairing, despairing strength, strength to the weak, and justice, justice to the oppressed. Amen. Amen.
let us pray. O oh God, we thank you for the message that we have received today from the Archbishop of Cagayan de Oro, Archbishop Antonio J. Ledesma. We thank you for this challenge to Catholics and Christians to journey together in a journey of ecclesiality, a journey of mutually reconciled diversity, and in this uh, brave new world that should be full of hope because we are going to work together because as Archbishop Suderblom reminds us, doctrine divides, action unites. So, O oh God, be with the efforts of all the local churches that have been inspired by the one ecumenical family statement in May of Catholics and Protestants that we will carve out a new world together in a journey of hope, a journey of mutual, mutually enriching diversity and that we together can learn from one another as we uh, walk and we concretize our faith in the orthopraxis or in the correct practice of our faith. O oh God, we pray that uh, you will make our church, the UCCP Cosmopolitan Church, try to help lead the way so that we can demonstrate to the world that we indeed who believe in you are one as you and your father are one. And now as we uh, continue with our work as a church, make us truly worthy of our calling. We now pray, O oh God, for all the members of our church, uh, and especially those who have come near and knelt before you to listen to their pleas. They may be in some kind of problematic situations, or they may just want to praise you for some blessings received. Whatever it is that they have in their hearts, grant it to them it be, if it be thy will. We also ask this for those who are just standing where they are. Grant them the desires of their hearts if it be thy will. We ask you, O God, to heal, strengthen those in our church that are not too well or who are old enough to be able to come and join us here. Uh, we especially pray for our former president, Fidel V. Ramos, uh, one whose friends is trying to look for him today. We pray for members of our church like Mel Morales, James Raterta, Bing Soledad, uh, Architect Ato, who are also needing your help in terms of uh, strengthening their uh, bodies and uh, recovering from whatever illnesses they may have had. We ask you, O oh God, to also bless the women of the church uh, who also need to be uh, need your strength and uh, to be re to recover quickly. Sister Leona Duran, who just got out of the hospital, Sister Norma Privado, uh, Sister um, uh, Malu Ason, Sister um, uh, Risa Barico, and uh, others, including uh, Maribel, and whose brother Randy needs or has to walk or should be able to walk. We also pray, pray O oh God, for Brother Warto in Hingog City, Sister um, B. Torrevillas and their son Warren, who's taking care of his dad. Oh God, there are so many things we'd like to pray for. We all are aware, or you are aware, of the needs of our church and the need for our concert, our uh, virtual Christmas concert to succeed, not only in terms of the wonderful performance, but also in the matter of response to our call uh, for uh, help. 
We pray, O oh God, for uh, uh, the lectures that will be held this week. The lecture of Archbishop Tony Antonio Ledesma tomorrow from 8 to 12 on 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines, together with Father Dionito Cabillas of the Iglesia Filipina Independiente, both of whom will be speaking on this journey of the church through 500 years. The Wednesday Forum of God on Wednesday, we will be talking about criteria for electing church leaders, uh, nation, national leaders. <clears throat> Please be with us and uh, try to join us 1.30 to 4.30 uh, that day. And we ask you, God, to bless the second lecture of uh, Professor T. Valentino Sitoy Jr. on the uh, Reformation, uh, Counter-Reformation, and the uh, Ecumenical Movement and the Vatican II. This will be the second lecture, O oh God, and he will be speaking uh, about all these uh, developments, recent developments, the uh, uh, joint declaration on justification uh, by the Lutherans and the Catholics, and all the other declarations between the Reformed Church and the Catholics, as well as the uh, uh, Episcopalians and the Catholics. All these joint declarations of unity, of uh, working together, uh, so that the world may believe that you have uh, uh, been sent by the Father. O oh God, make us one. Make us truly one in hope and in charity. We pray, O oh God, as we part one from the other, for thy blessings and for thy uh, benediction. And now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen and amen.